In spite of all this, he would still have been received at Combray. He was, of course, hardly the friend my parents would have chosen for me. They had, in the end, decided that the tears which he had shed on hearing of my grandmother's illness were genuine enough, but they knew, either instinctively or from their own experience, that our early impulsive emotions have but little influence over our later actions and the conduct of our lives, and that regard for moral obligations, lo loyalty to our friends, patience in finishing our work, obedience to a regimen, have a sure foundation in habits solidly formed and blindly followed than in these momentary transports, ardent and sterile. They would have preferred to block as companions for myself boys who would have given me no more than it is proper for one boy to give to another, who would not unexpectedly send me a basket of fruit because they happened that morning to have thought of me with affection, but who, being incapable of inclining in my favor by any single impulse of their imagination and sensibility, the exact balance of the duties and claims of friendship, were as incapable of loading the scales to my detriment. Even our faults will not easily divert from the path of their duty toward us, those conventional natures of which my great aunt was the model, who, estranged for years from a niece to whom she never spoke, yet made no change in the will that she had left that niece, in which she had left that niece the whole of her fortune because she was her next of kin and it was the proper thing to do. But I was fond of Bloch. My parents wished me to be happy. And the insoluble problems that I set myself on such texts as the absolutely meaningless beauty of La Fille de Minos et de Pacifae tired me more and made me more unwell than would have further talks with him, although my mother judged them pernicious. And he would still have been received at Combray, but for one thing. That same night, after dinner, having informed me a piece of news that had a great influence on my later life, making it happier at one time and then unhappy, that no woman ever thought of anything but love, and that there was not one of them whose resistance a man could not overcome. He had gone on to assure me that he had heard it said on unimpeachable authority that my great aunt herself had led a stormy life in her youth and had been notoriously kept. I could not refrain from passing on so important a piece of information to my parents. The next time Blake called, he was not admitted. And afterward, when I met him on the street, he greeted me with extreme coldness. But in the matter of Bergot, he had spoken truly. For the first few days, like a tomb that one will become mad about, but which one does not at first discern, the things I was to love so passionately in his style were not yet clear to me. I could not lay down the novel of his that I was reading, but I thought that I was interested in the subject alone, as in the first dawn of love, when we go every day to meet a woman at some party or entertainment by the delights of which we believe ourselves attracted. Then I observed the rare, almost archaic expressions that he liked to employ at certain points where a hidden flow of harmony, an internal prelude, would elevate his style. And it was at such points as these, too, that he would begin to speak of the vain dream of life, of the inexhaustible torrent of fair forms, of the sterile, splendid torture of understanding and loving, of the moving effigies that ennoble for all time the charming and venerable facades of our cathedrals, that he would express a whole system of philosophy, new to me, by the use of marvelous imagery, to the inspiration of which one would have ascribed that song of harps that arose then, and to the accompaniment of, of which that, that imagery gave something sublime. One of these passages of Bergot, the third or fourth that I detached from the rest, filled me with a joy to, the, to which the joy I had felt in the first bore no comparison, a joy I felt myself to experience in a deeper region of my soul, 
more indivisible, more vast, from which all obstacles and partitions seem to have been swept away. For what had happened was that, while I recognized in this passage the same taste for uncommon expressions, the same bursts of music, the same idealist philosophy that had been present in the earlier passages without my having taken them into account as the source of my pleasure, I now no longer had the impression of being confronted by a particular passage in one of Bergot's books, which traced on the surface of my mind a purely linear figure, but rather of the ideal passage of Bergot, common to all of his books, and to which all the similar passages, now becoming merged in it, had added a kind of density and volume by which my own understanding seemed to be enlarged. I was by no means Bergot's sole admirer. He was the favorite writer also of a friend of my mother's, a literary lady. A literary lady. In order to finish reading Bergot's latest volume, Dr. Du Bourbon had kept all of his patients waiting. And it was from his consulting room and from a park near Cambrai that some of the first seeds were scattered of that predilection for Bergot a very rare species in those days, but now so widespread that one finds it flowering everywhere throughout Europe and America, and even in the tiniest villages, a flower both ideal and common. What my mother's friend, and it would seem what Dr. Du Bourbon liked above all of the writings of Bergot, was just what I liked. The same flow of melody, the same old-fashioned phrases, and certain others quite simple and familiar, but so placed by him in such a light as to hint at a particular quality, taste, on his part, and also, in the sad passages of his books, a sort of roughness, a tone that was almost harsh. And he himself, no doubt, must have felt that these were his principal attractions, for in his later books, if he had come across some great truth or the name of a famous cathedral, he would break off his narrative, and in an invocation, an apostrophe, a lengthy prayer, would give a free outlet to that effluence which in the earlier volumes remained submerged in his prose, discernible only in a rippling of its surface. And perhaps even more delightful, more harmonious, when it was thus veiled from the eye, when the reader could give no precise indication of where the murmur of the current began or where it died away. These passages in which he delighted were our favorites also. For my own part, I knew them all by heart. I was disappointed when he resumed the thread of his narrative. Whenever he spoke of something whose beauty had until then remained hidden from me, of pine forests or hailstorms, of Notre Dame de Paris or Atali or Fedre, by some piece of imagery, he would make their beauty explode into my consciousness. And so, being aware that the universe can contained innumerable elements that my feeble senses would be powerless to discern if he did not bring them within my reach, I wish that I might have his opinions, some metaphor of his, on everything, especially on such things as I might have an opportunity someday of seeing for myself, and among such things, particularly on some of the historical monuments of France, on certain views of the sea, because the emphasis with which in his books he referred to these showed that he regarded them as rich in significance and beauty. But alas, on almost everything, his opinion was unknown to me. I had no doubt that it would differ entirely from my own, since his came down from an unknown world toward which I was striving to raise myself, convinced that my thoughts would have seemed pure ineptitude to that perfected spirit. I had so completely made a clean sweep of them all that if I happened to find in one of his books something that had already occurred to me, my heart would swell with gratitude and pride as though some deity had, in his infinite bounty, restored it to me, had pronounced it to be beautiful and right. It happened now and then that a page of his would say the very same things that I used often at night when I was unable to sleep to write to my grandmother and mother, and so concisely and well that Bergot's page had the appearance of a collection of epigraphs for me to set at the head of my letters. And so, too, in later years, when I began to compose a book of my own, and the quality of some of my sentences seemed so inadequate that I could not make up my mind to go on with the undertaking, I would find the equivalent of my sentences in Bergot. 
but it was only then, when I read them in his work, that I could enjoy them, when it was I myself who composed them, in my anxiety that they should exactly reproduce what I perceived in my mind, and in my fear of their not turning out true to life, I had more than enough time to ask myself whether what I was writing would be pleasant to read. But in reality, there was no kind of language, no kind of ideas that I really liked, except these. My anxious and unsatisfactory attempts were themselves a token of my love, a love without pleasure, but profound. And so, when I came suddenly upon similar phrases in the writing of another and was thus free from scruples, from strictness, and having no need to torment myself, I indulged to the full my own appetite for such phrases, just as a cook who, for once, has no dinner to prepare for others, finds at last the time to be a gourmand himself. One day, having found in a book by Bergoff some joke about an old family servant, to which the writer's solemn and magnificent style added a great deal of irony, but which was what I had often said to my grandmother about Françoise. And when another time I discovered that he thought not unworthy of reflection in one of those mirrors of truth that were his writings, a remark similar to one I had had occasion to make our, about our friend Monsieur de Grandin, and moreover, my remarks on Françoise and Monsieur de Grandin, which were among those that I would most resolutely have sacrificed for Bergotte's sake in the belief that he would find them quite without interest, then, it suddenly seemed to me that my own humble existence and the realms of truth were less widely separated than I'd supposed, that at certain points they actually coincided. And in my newfound confidence and joy, I wept on the writer's pages as in the arms of a long-lost father. <laughs>